Hello everyone, welcome back to the channel and to another Arx Angel RC video. I thought I'd follow up the F405 Wing Nano how-to video with a how-to of the F765 Wing since I'm in the mood for how-to videos this month and I now have that particular boat in three planes so might as well get to talk about it. Plus, I noticed there were some differences from what I did with the F405 Wing Nano and hence the Matic F405 Wing, so thought it would be a good idea to go over them, plus some additional new features that I was recently informed about, which really excited me since I've been waiting for these for roughly 7 years now. But, let's get on with it then. The F765 Wing is the F405 Wing's bigger brother, not in size but in capabilities. It has 3 more servo outputs, a much more powerful back for those servos, 8 amps continuous versus 5 amps for the 405, one more UART port, a faster processor, IMU redundancy, dual camera inputs with a video switch and the possibility to turn their power on and off remotely, up to 8S power input and all of this for just 1 gram more in weight. Not a bad deal. There is also the price increase but you do get a good deal more for your money assuming you actually need all of this stuff. For me the largest benefit in the F765 wing controller is the dual camera input, the higher voltage input and the much more powerful servo back, which hopefully means reliability too. Also, IMU redundancy is not a bad idea either. So, assuming you've already soldered the pins and cables to your board, Let's move on. The board does support INAF and ArduPilot, but as usual, I'm going with ArduPilot, and in particular, ArduPlane in this instance. Flashing it is pretty much the same as always and all the other controllers. Download firmware file with BL from ArduPilot website, connect the board to the computer while holding the DFU button, flash it to the board using INAF or Betaflight configurator, power cycle and then connect to Mission Planner for the rest of the setup. Easy as pie. Once connected to Mission Planner, the first thing I always do is to disable the compass, but since I can see that the firmware can now detect if there is one connected and has it disabled by default, I just go ahead and uncheck all of the other checkboxes just in case. Next on the task list is calibrating the accelerometer, go to the tab, click the top button and follow the instructions. Make sure you rotate the board accordingly, refer to the arrow on top of the controller for the orientation. Then I go on to set the flight motor we'll be using and in this case those would be manual, fly-by-wire A and auto, so I can have waypoints and auto takeoff on a single mode. And for return to land I usually switch off the radio to get the plane to fail safe. Has worked well for me so far. This is going to change now though, but more on that a bit later. Servo outputs are what I tackle next. And in this case I set up this F765 wing for the Flying Dragon twin tractor plane. So settings will be specific to it. If you have any other type of plane your settings will be different from these but the process is the same. So since it is a twin tractor and I have all these available servo outputs on this controller I set up two throttle outputs and two aileron outputs. So I can be able to configure each one separately if needed and this way I don't have to use a Y cable thus fewer points of failure. Since this is a VTAIL plane, I set up VTAIL left and VTAIL right, that is looking at the plane from the back forward. And last, I set up an RC pass-through channel, which basically means this will forward chosen RC channel coming from the receiver straight to the output on the flight controller without altering it, so I can control my video antenna retract system that I have on the plane. Once all of these are set, it is a good idea to power cycle the controller so the changes can take effect. Next up is the OSD setup and on the first sub tab, don't forget to set the font and the battery voltage level for it to start flashing, warning you that battery voltage is getting low. For the OSD, I usually use only one screen and don't switch between them during flight, but you can also set that up here if you want to be able to switch between multiple screens with other sets of information or without any information at all. Then just rearrange the items on the screen as you like 
make them and as I also stated in my previous video the wind speed and direction indicator works even without an airspeed sensor and it is super useful in a lot of situations so I strongly advise that you enable it and keep an eye on it throughout the flight. Moving on to the battery monitor, unlike on the F405 wing Nano, on the F765 wing it is not enabled by default so this needs to be done manually. Go to full parameter tree, find BAT monitor and input 4 in the cell next to it. This will enable monitoring of voltage and current. Write the changes and refresh the parameter list. Once they load up, open up the BAT extended parameters and you will notice that the correct values are entered here by default when you compare them to those provided by Matic on their website, so nothing needs changing. Only thing you can set here is the battery capacity, just so the system would know it. This is generally used when setting up a battery failsafe, I assume, so unless you do that, this is not really a required step. Scrolling down the parameter list, the next stop is the RSSI setup. Since I am flying this plane with a Dragonlink system, I can either set it to 1, the analog pin, or to 2, the RC channel PVM value. Because the Dragonlink receivers can be set up both ways. Initially, I set it up for analog pin, which may require the voltage range for that pin to be adjusted after refreshing the parameters, depending on the output voltage of the RSSI pin on the Dragonlink receiver. And this would also require me to run one more wire between the receiver and the flight controller for the RSSI channel. But I later set up the receiver to output an RSSI signal on channel 7 as a PVM value so I wouldn't have to run that extra wire. So I set the RSSI type to 2 and then next to RSSI channel input 7 for the number of the channel that is supplying the RSSI PVM value. Right above that you can adjust the PVM range if needed to get the scaling right just in case your system's maximum and minimum PVM values are different from the defaults. With this done I moved on to set a larger return to land and loiter radius because the default value is pretty small for a large plane like the Flying Dragon. Go to the bottom of the parameter list where you will find WP. Open that up and next to loiter rad input the size of the radius in meters that you think would work well for your model. As a rule, I think 100 meters should be the minimum because otherwise the circle is pretty tight and the plane needs to be banked a good deal, which means higher throttle to keep the speed up to maintain that banked angle. I may even change it to 200 meters later on for this plane if I decide 130 is too small. Now, Next item on the list is quite important and I've been known to forget to set this on occasion which leads to some pretty fun maiden flights since the battery and ESC pads on these controllers are actually at the back but often enough the controllers are placed in the back of the plane. So rather than make the wires longer and have them go around the controller I just rotate it and mount it with the back facing forward. That is okay and good so long as I remember to actually tell the autopilot that it is mounted backwards. Sometimes I do this after the maiden flight, ridiculous as it is. Plane still flies though, don't get me wrong, it still stabilizes, just any auto mode will try to work in reverse and attempts for altitude gains will result in it nose diving for the ground. So scroll back up the parameter list all the way to the top and find the AHRC tree, open that up and in there you will see the AHRC orientation. If mounting the flight controller any other way than with the arrow facing forward on top, you need to come here and adjust this setting accordingly. Good thing is, with ArduPilot you can set it in a host of orientations, so just find yours in the options to the right and input the number attached to it. In my case I am looking at a yo rotation of 180 degrees, in other words, but facing forward, which is option 4. Input that in the parameter field and write the changes. Another two parameters that call for some attention are trim X and trim Y. Once you get the plane flying and in the stabilized mode it is not flying level but it is slightly banked to one side or pitched up or down, you would use these parameters short of doing another accelerometer calibration. 
to fix the level of your model. To the right you can read the description of these parameters so you'd know how they work, but make small changes and check the results. Don't make large changes at once to avoid getting the plane too banked or pitched to one side. Go slow and easy and it should work out okay in the end, but only use this if you are unwilling to do another, better accelerometer calibration routine, which I find ridiculous and difficult to do once the controller is in the plane, especially on a 2.2 meter wingspan beast like the Flying Dragon. Next things that I want to turn your attention to are the UART ports and mainly because those differ in some ways to the way they were mapped out on the Matic F405 wing and respectively the Racer Star F405 wing Nano. So I think it would be nice to note the changes so people will not get too confused. If you have any experience with the F405 wing and wire the F765 wing in the same way, pretty much nothing of the peripherals connected to the UART ports will work. So let's dive into this. Whereas on the F405 wing, the SBUS slash PPM input from the receiver went to UART2 marked RX2 on the board, on the F765 wing it should go to UART6 labeled as R6. On the F405 wing, the GPS plugs into UART3 labeled respectively TX3 and RX3 on the board and a second GPS unit would go to UART4 labeled TX4 and RX4 on the board. But on the F765 wing, the main GPS plugs into UART2 and the second GPS into UART3, which in Arduplane parameter list are actually serial 3 and serial 4 parameter trees. So it's a bit of a mess because the UART numbers do not correspond to the serial numbers in the parameters like they did for the F405 wing, but Matek do provide a pretty convenient table with the mapping of the board for Arduplane, so please refer to it if something is unclear. I have provided the link for it under the video description along with a few other useful links so please check them out. Since I want to also output Mavlink telemetry to the Dragonlink receiver so I can use the Dragonlink's telemetry channel to get it to the ground and to my laptop without the need for a separate telemetry radio, I also need to set that up here at the serial port parameters. To that end, I will be setting serial 6 for 38k connection speed and option 2, which is Mavlink 2 for the protocol parameter. I chose Mavlink 2 because historically that has worked for me with the Dragonlink system, so tend to keep to that setup. Once the changes are done, write the parameters and in my case I really wanted to try if the telemetry link would work through the Dragonlink system now, so I set up the receiver for it, plugged it in, powered on the system, paired the Dragonlink's Bluetooth to my laptop, got the new COM ports shown in Mission Planner, chose the correct one and the right speed and it did work. So what you see loading here is a wireless telemetry link between the laptop and the F765 wing via the Dragonlink radio system. Pretty awesome I'd say. So moving on for the rest of the setup, it is finally time for the radio calibration since there is a receiver connected. Go to that tab under the initial setup tab, click the calibrate radio button, read the instructions and then move the sticks to all extreme positions a few times, holding them there for a few seconds or two and also move all switches used for your particular model, only the ones assigned to channels. Then click the button again, wait a bit and it will show you a confirmation screen with the calibration results. Now, following is the new addition to the firmware that I've been waiting for for so long. After I set up all of this, I updated Mission Planner to the latest version, which in this case is 1.3.74, and under the configuration tab, you can see a few new items, one of which is user parameters, and in there you can see some RC channel options, and this here place allows you to set up more actions, flight modes, etc. on additional channels, separate from the default channel 8, 
which is the modes channel for audio plane, which means no more need to do intricate channel mixing inside of your radio to get more than three modes on the Tyrannis. This is now sort of like what you have in iNav in that you're able to assign any flight mode or action to almost any channel you want, which is awesome. I can finally have auto and return to land on separate switches and not have to switch off the radio to trigger return to land. At least seven years in the making, but it's finally here. Now the last thing I want to show you how to do is how to set up the camera switch. This can be a bit confusing at first, but once you grasp the idea it is not so difficult, though you would need to refer to the information provided by Matek on their website. Just a reminder, link is below the video. Also, make sure both cameras, in case you will be using two cameras, are set up the same, either both PAL or both NTSC. So, looking at the relay information on the Matek website, we can see that, for instance, relay 1 has, let's call it an address, of 28, and relay 2 has an address of 34, and so on. At this point, you need to decide which relay pin you want to use for the camera switch, and note its address. From here, you have two options. 1. Go to the full parameter tree and find the RC channel parameters. Decide which channel you want to control the camera switch with. Open its parameter subtree and on the option line input the relay address and then write the changes. Or with the newer version of the Arduplane firmware and the new version of Mission Planner, go to the user parameters tab, decide which channel you want to use for this and in the drop down options you can see all of the relays listed. Just pick one, it basically does the same job without you having to look up their addresses from the website. Also keep in mind only relays 1 to 4 can be used for this, so do not assign relay 5 or 6. For the next part we need to assign the camera switching function to your relay of choice. Looking again on the Matek website we can see that the camera switch has an address of 82. So note that down, go back to mission planner and to the full parameter tree and find the relay parameters. Open up the parameters and input 82 to the right of your chosen relay. Then write the parameters and that basically does it. Now, once you have the whole system wired up and working, when you flip your switch of choice, you should see the video feed change between both cameras. I hope this explanation makes it at least a bit clearer on how this works. You assign the camera switching function to a relay and then you assign the relay to a channel of your choice. Nothing to it, just isn't very well explained by Matex, so needs a simpler explanation. If you want to use only one camera, you don't really need to set all of this up. Now, finally, you can install the F765 wing in your plane of choice and go have fun with it. I mounted mine in the Flying Dragon plane and have done quite a few flights now, testing various things, and I am happy to report that it is working and behaving quite well, just as you would expect from the Arduino plane firmware. I've run a number of simulated mapping waypoint missions, testing endurance and have been able to get over 2 hours of flight time and over 180 kilometers covered in that time with the current 6S8P lithium ion pack and I'm happy to report no issues from the F765 wing, which is reassuring because this is a large and heavy plane and even a light crash could cause a lot of damage, so would hope all goes well from here on out and there won't be any nasty surprises. I should have a review of the Flying Dragon sometime soon as well, just have to deal with a few other planes first. For those interested, I've linked all that I've used in this video in the description below, those are affiliate links and because this is my full time job, the income I get from you guys buying stuff via those links is how I support this channel and how I support myself at no additional cost to you, so you will have my eternal gratitude should you decide to go through them next time you need to make a purchase. Another way you can support me is Patreon, the link is also there and I would like to say a big thank you to all the people who have supported me so far in any way and would continue to do so. I would also love it if you like, share and subscribe if you haven't already because this helps the video get seen more and don't forget to hit that bell button so you can be notified when I upload a new one. Also consider following me on Facebook. Happy and safe flying and I will see you in the next one.